Welcome to the groundbreaking news program that delves into the heart of Mormonism, your weekly window into the unique intersection of news, history, and culture that resonates with the tapestry of Mormonism. So whether you're tuning in from the heart of Utah or joining us from around the world, your favorite news program starts now, where news meets insight and the stories of our faith unfold. How are you? How are you doing? I'm not too bad. You know, last week I was on Mormonism Live. I had the mm -hmm. opportunity to fill into our for our FM, and I noticed that you have that raging applause. I wonder if we should do that on the newscast. We should maybe add that. I'll. Uh, we should think about doing that. Let's have a conversation this week, and uh, yeah, let's get the consensus. And if everybody wants to do it, let's throw some applause in. Yeah, I think that was really fun. I felt like. <sighs> We had a lot of viewers who either said it was too loud, so we did less than the vo the sound oh. level of it. And we had okay. viewers that said uh, they didn't like it at all. Uh, um, well, there but, you go. Yeah, but I think RFM loves a good applause for himself, doesn't he? I was going to say, I think yeah. he does. I think yes, it makes his day. <laughs> yep. Well, um, are you taking the lead tonight or do you want me to? Do you know we didn't even talk about that ahead of time, did we? I can do no. it if that's no. that's okay. And I can point out to everybody that there are only two of us now, right? Now there were two, but only temporarily because RFM is taking the UK by storm. Can we say that? He is enjoying a little uh, free time. Uh, he's yeah. been putting a lot of time into podcasting. Yes. He essentially records or works on something related to the podcast world Every single just about day of the week, uh, I think maybe he takes sort of Sundays off, but the rest of the week he's producing stuff and uh, going into the the office, the studio, the bunker, yeah, and recording things. And uh, John's off this week as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, I feel like RFM retired and yet just then stepped into this more than full time gig of all the different amazing shows that he puts out. So, yeah. so he deserves it. How fun! And and if anybody wants to check out the pictures of his amazing trip taking the UK by storm, it's all over his Facebook page, and he's just having a blast. I think he hooked up with Nemo and Peter Bleakley. I think I saw. So he did. Looks <laughs> like he grabbed a bite with them and got uh, the some British perspective on Mormonism. That's it. Very, very important. All right. So today we are going to cover several really important stories. There has been a lot of news in this post-conference week. We're going to talk about the temple interview questions being updated. Everybody is buzzing about that. We're also going to do a little bit of an eclipse apocalyptic review. What did happen with that apocalypse that was supposed to hit us on Monday? We're going to cover Asia and the word of wisdom. Very interesting. And also red chairs, filters, and wheelchairs. And if you don't know what that refers to, you will soon find out. So I believe, Bill, your uh, story is first about the temple interview questions, isn't it? It is. So here we go, folks. I hope you enjoy the uh, the video. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Mormon newscast. First, the LDS Church's recent revisions to temple interview questions, specifically regarding the wearing of sacred undergarments. We note for the third week in a row that many in and out of the faith question the underlying control inherent in regulating how individuals wear their underwear. Such control over personal attire is seen by many as unhealthy and invasive. We were told the church was about to issue a revised question on garments, and that's exactly what they did. But it wasn't the question that seemed to draw the line in the sand. Instead, it was the revised statement on wearing of the garments that did the trick. It says, the garment of the holy priesthood reminds us of the veil in the temple, and that veil is symbolic of Jesus Christ. When you put on your garment, you put on a sacred symbol of Jesus Christ, wearing it as an outward expression of your inner commitment to follow him. The garment is also a reminder of your temple covenants. You should wear the garment day and night throughout your life, when it must be removed for activities that cannot reasonably be done while wearing the garment, seek to restore it as soon as possible. As you keep your covenants, including the sacred privilege to wear the garment as instructed in the initiatory ordinances, you will have greater access to the Savior's mercy, protection, strength, and power. The LDS Church's decision to remove the 
quote unquote night and day stipulation from the Temple interview question itself on garments only a, a few years ago, only to reinsert it into the revised statement has caught attention. This strategic move addresses the incongruity between the original question and temple practices while still giving the men at the church office building a way to emphasize the expectation for continuous garment wearing. The fact that church leadership is laying down the law on garment wearing is nothing new. We've been discussing it for weeks. But what did seem new and maybe even strange is that in a surprising shift, that the veil in the temple is symbolic of Jesus Christ. However, this interpretation has raised eyebrows among some members. Theologically, in just plain logically, the veil has been understood in Mormon theology as representing concepts such as the veil of forgetfulness and the relation between mortality and the afterlife. That there is a barrier to our remembering what is on the other side of mortality, both before we came to this mortal life and what lies after when we die and cross over, as well as it being a barrier preventing our ability to go back to the Father's presence after death without having met certain conditions upon death. This new teaching seems to diverge from established symbolism, creating meaning where none ever existed before, leading to raised eyebrows and questions for clarification. Another notable change in the temple interview questions was the expansion of the Sabbath day related inquiry. The new question now encompasses a broader scope, reflecting an increased emphasis on Sabbath observance, both at home and in church settings, as if that wasn't simply understood before. Lastly, I couldn't help but notice that the top 15 leaders of the church would, as a collective group, potentially fail several interview questions themselves, namely, number five, number six, number nine, and number 15, which should also have them failing question 16 if they would be honest with themselves. Problem here is that they are only as honest as they know how to be. Questions related to honesty, cleanliness, and Christ-like behavior strangely pose the greatest challenge for the highest ranking leaders of the faith. This insight raises questions about the standards set forth by the church and the accountability of its leadership. After three weeks of intense focus on other people's underwear, there's a growing sentiment with myself and the rest of us here at the Mormon Newscast, and I can only imagine with each of you as well, that it's time to move on. The prolonged discussion, while certainly newsworthy, has left many feeling, myself included, underwear fatigue, and a need for me and the rest of us to shift future reports towards other pressing issues facing the church and its members. Back to you, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, I think That's we realized there. we had fatigue uh, we when we were talking about making the thumbnail. And you said, Bill, oh my gosh, can we really have another thumbnail that has garments on it? We just can't. But I'm sorry, it has been a topic of conversation. I mean, everywhere. And it has been in the news. So you know, I thought you did a really good job in that video because I also felt, oh my goodness, when I read that statement, I said, are they just making stuff up now? <laughs> and I'm not even being facetious. A lot of those things that were described in that statement, and I was in the church for five and a half decades, I had never heard anything like that. And to me, one of the most, I don't know, reaching things. And, and I noticed this in Sister Dennis's talk at conference, and I think you did too, where she kept calling it the garment of the Holy Priesthood over and over, the garment of the Holy Priesthood, the garment of the Holy Priesthood. I thought, what is this? What is this going to be? And now they're using that term everywhere. And I have started seeing posts on faithful sites saying, this is killing two birds with one stone. When I wear the garment of the Holy Priesthood, I have the priesthood as a woman. So there it is. Women do have the priesthood. And they're also locked into wearing their garments. So whoever came up with that, kudos. 
brilliant. Yeah, it's it's a strange thing. I've never heard in all my time in the church. I joined at 17, and I think I went inactive sometime around the age of, say, 37, 38, 39, somewhere in there. And uh, I'd never heard one. The veil at the temple is symbolic of Jesus Christ himself. Now, mm -hmm. it might remind us of the covenants that we made mm -hmm. in regards to what the Savior has done for us. But I, I never heard that the veil equaled Jesus Christ. And it seems as though modern leadership has no problem. Uh, ongoing restoration being mm -hmm. another example of uh, changing translation to revelation in some places. It seems as though... This new this new leadership that's been out, of course, whatever, whatever, a decade almost now at this point, has no problem rewriting uh, church doctrine. So it just seems like a strange thing. Yeah, it is kind of interesting. And obviously there's a purpose, there's an underlying purpose to all of it. And I remember when they changed the wording of the question, just not to say night and day anymore, but to sort of leave it more up to interpretation. And I actually feel they could, <laughs> they could take care of a lot of problems by doing that. You know, don't mention coffee specifically, kind of phase it out. And I really felt there was sort of a relaxing on the garment rule and just leaving it more up to personal interpretation. I think a lot of people took it that way and that's what they were doing. They felt good about it. They felt that they'd had personal revelation. Um, they didn't feel locked into doing something that for whatever reason they were not comfortable doing. And now having had that latitude back in. And, and I think that's why you're seeing a lot of people that are really confused by what's happening now. And again, I've read so many things that have said, you know, my personal relationship with Christ, with God, with how I wear the garment, what it means to me, why is frequency and night and day, why is that a part of it? Why? It should just be a relationship on my terms with my spirituality. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Which makes you think maybe it's, it's only sort of a more punitive kind of a thing, right? I mean, that's the only thing you can think is a control, a control issue. If it's not about a person relationship, it's not about personal revelation, then it's about control. So, but I do know a lot of people are still talking about it. I know we don't want to talk about it anymore, <laughs> but it is still a hot button. And I know there yeah. have been broadcasts like Ward Radio where you have faithful Mormon women who have spoken and said, we love to wear the garment and we understand what it means and we're willing to wear the garment. And so that's fine too. It, it really is up to everybody's interpretation of what they want to do. And I think that's what we'd like to see that everyone can do what they're comfortable with, with their own personal revelation when it comes to the garment of the Holy priesthood. You have to add that part now of the Holy priesthood. Yeah. <laughs> I know that my internet's a little bit glitchy, Rebecca. Oh, I'm hoping that maybe I can restart my computer really quick. Okay. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Do you want to just duck out and, and leave me? If, do you want to put up, I guess you can't really put up yeah. my slides for the next section. So I could whistle. I could, let's see, tap dance. I could. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that this will stay up on the screen. I don't know if it will for oh, sure. Well, it um, might. We can try it. Let's one see. Of the, okay, audio. okay. Okay. Let me see. So let what me, about that? Yeah, let me, yep. There you okay, go. You try to jump out and I'll just go yep. into my next right, segment, gonna, you know. It's Sounds a live good. Why don't I show. Put one, why don't we go to the first one? Yep. We'll start. Oops. Okay. I'm going to start there if that's okay. All right. Okay. So yeah. if we're done talking about garments, which we hope we are, because like I said, if you look back at our last three newscasts, there are garments on the, on the thumbnail because this has been really a hot topic. So another extremely hot topic that's been going on for months, if not years, is the eclipse that happened on Monday, April the 8th. And I'm calling this eclipse madness. And I've made some AI, of course, of campers driving to see the eclipse, people out in their lawn chairs. I personally know a lot of people who made the trek, drove to get in the path. It was a swath um, from... I think Texas to Maine, where you could find a nice spot to sit and witness this eclipse. And it seemed to have really important meaning to different people and for different reasons. And of course, a lot of us heard that the world was going to end on the 8th. Here we are now. So I guess that did not happen. Oh, and look, my slides have gone. So dang it. I want to continue when my slides are up because I worked so hard on my AI. So I guess maybe I'll just go to my first one. Um, I want to talk about the fact that <laughs> 
Why is an eclipse such a big deal when we absolutely know we can predict it? We know for years and decades when it's going to happen. And we have in the past, we have for centuries been able to predict when an eclipse is going to happen. So I was going to read this little thing here and we can look at my slide when I get back. It says, humans have been calculating the reoccurrence of solar eclipses for thousands of years. Many ancient cultures predicted these events mathematically um, using what? Anthony Aveni, a pioneer of astro astronomy professor emeritus at Colgate University calls the 6-5 beat. I thought this was really interesting. Solar and lunar eclipses usually reoccur every six lunar months, or sometimes even more rarely, they will occur every five lunar months. So over time, if you're just observing these over and over, you can calculate the interv intervals. So for example, the ancient Maya, the Chinese, the Babylonians, they all honed in on two very predictable patterns for the eclipse. And they called it the six, five beat because they would reoccur one pattern every 41 months and one pattern every 47. And I tell you this just to point out that we we know when they're going to show up. So this incredible symbolism that is placed on the eclipse um, meaning in different cultures that has different meanings to everybody. And sometimes it causes mass hysteria. Oh, look, Bill's back. How is it now? Oh, we'll see how good it does. Let's see what happens oh, here. That seems better. All right. Let's continue on. Okay. I can take it. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So I have a picture of some stony that, people watching the eclipse. In fact, the oldest surviving depiction of an eclipse um, is at a place known as the Hills of the Witch. And it's in Ireland. And this is a Neolithic passage tombs marked by large cairns built in like fourth millennium BCE, nearly a millennium older than Stonehenge. And I don't know if you can see there, but it does seem to be a depiction of an eclipse. So the bottom line is we've known about these for millennia, but still they just cause this effect in human beings. So I kind of looked into the different cultural significances through the past of what a eclipse could mean. So in Aboriginal Australia culture, they're not afraid of the eclipse, but instead they look at it as a romantic event, a sort of the sun and the moon coming together. So it's sort of a, a love fest, I guess. Um, ancient Chinese cultures believed that it was a sign of doom. And they believed that a solar eclipse meant a dragon or a demon was actually eating the sun. So a time of, of fear when an, an eclipse would appear. Um, ancient Greeks had another take on the event. They considered it to be an omen or a symbolic of the God's anger toward human beings. So they took it personally. <laughs> when they saw an eclipse, they said, God's angry with this. Um, in the Navajo Nation, a more positive outlook as far as what it symbolizes, they believe that it's a sacred time of quiet and meditation, and some even refuse to view the eclipse because they believe that it is spiritual and not a show. So again, we're seeing so many different interpretations of the eclipse. Now let's talk about what Christianity thinks. And I have to say, I'm kind of proud of this AI right here, which is Jesus coming down to earth, standing on a mountain in the middle of the eclipse with his arms out. Uh, for many Christians, the solar eclipse is a direct sign from God about judgment heading to the earth for human sins and the end of times. Several passages from the Christian Bible state that the last days there will be signs from God shown in the sun, the moon, the stars. Many people of the Christian faith believe that the upcoming eclipse, meaning the one that just happened, is another telltale sign of the Savior's imminent return, judgment, and more. And I have to say, I've never heard this more um, from the Mormon community than I have at this eclipse. And I know you, Bill, did an episode on the seventh seals and the seventh signs and how everything was culminating. Kind of started with Moroni's trumpet falling. This is on Mormonism Live. Went through the whole cycle, missionaries called back, different eclipses, earthquakes, culminating this event that was on April 8th. And I do know people who uh, went to Missouri to watch. They went to the Garden of Eden. Um, they really thought something was going to happen in, in the Mormon culture. There were a lot like this. Um, and they were not alone. I read a really interesting article here about prisoners, men that were incarcerated, and they were not going to be allowed to witness the eclipse. They were not going to be allowed out into the yard. It was not yard time. And they actually sued the prison, saying that it was part of their religious belief 
the religious observance that they be allowed to witness the eclipse. And they actually won the suit. But what's interesting is their religions were, and I have it written down here, a Baptist, a Muslim, a Seventh-day Adventist, two practitioners of Centuria, and an atheist. So it seems like there is a great appreciation and need to be part of the eclipse in multiple religions, which I find extremely interesting. Um, another story that was in the news. So a lot of Christians believed that this was the rapture. If you're not familiar with the, the rapture is, it's a time when faithful Christians will literally be, somebody said, sucked up like a vacuum into heaven to be with God and leaving the rest of us here on earth to be burnt into stubble. And some people- And if really I can just say, I can't wait because how- <laughs> Because housing prices will be a lot less at that point. You'll have your pick. That's right. I feel that way. And I have to just interject this. There is a real company that will take care of your pet if you've been ra raptured. It's a service that you can yeah. sign up for. And it says friendly atheists yep. will come and take your pet if you've been raptured. So you don't need to be concerned. Although I say, what kind of a loving God would rapture you and not your pet? I mean, I just can't imagine. But they took it very seriously. Um, here's a story about a woman who tipped two servers over $1,000 because the rapture was coming. And then after the rapture didn't happen, she went back to the restaurant and she demanded her money back. And she blamed them and she said that she'd been duped and she said that they'd coerced her, but that is not true. Um, she actually did tip them that, that much because she felt she didn't have any need for money anymore. So this is how serious people are taking these astrological happenings. And I have to say that in the LDS faith, and let me see if I can read these, there is, um, I came across several uh, where they were looking forward to this as a sign the last day, Christ is actually coming back, going to return. This is a, a Christian fire poppy site. And it says, April 8th, um, the great American eclipse is coming soon. It crosses, uh, the, and this is why this eclipse was so important. Several other eclipses happened and it formed a cross, very meaningful over certain cities. And they really took this to heart, like this really meant something. Um, eclipses forming interesting marks on the earth through the path of totality. All things denote there is a God, the glory and signature of his hand in the heavens and earth. We will be looking at this event through the lens of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, President Nelson, Holy Sites, Holy Times, President Nelson's 40th, the 10 tribes, Ezra's Eagle, General Conference, Last Day Cedar Tree, Cross of Peace, Egypt, and Jonah sign. So they really are looking for signs and symbols and indications about the future, what is going to happen. So I, I know a lot of people gathered in Missouri at the Garden of Eden. I know they thought that this was really going to happen. And as far as I can tell, nothing really happened except for a predicted eclipse. Is that how you saw it, Bill? Just a normal astro uh, astrological event that happens every so often, right? Yeah, that we can predict. And that's so. what's so funny. Yep. So I don't know that anything happened. However, I do know some people of the LDS faith who say that Jesus may be here and we just don't know it. The people who need to know know. And the people who don't need to know or aren't ready to know or aren't worthy to know, we don't know. So that's why I made the AI on the right. Maybe he is here wandering around and we just don't know. Maybe you and I, Bill, aren't supposed to know. Yeah, no one knows when he'll come back. And you know what? As far <laughs> as I know, he may not come back at all. <laughs> yeah, we have a different take on that. But there certainly was eclipse madness. Did you have any family that were really interested or involved? Do you know anybody that drove across the country? Uh, no, I mean, I had friends who were interested in seeing it. My dad, uh, wanted to, to sort of view it, but nobody with any sort of special spiritual or religious meaning attributed to it. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting time. And, and like I said, different religions take it in different ways and different people within those religions take it to different extremes. So we'll have to see what happens with the next eclipse, but this one was certainly highly anticipated to the point where some people are over tipping their servers, which never happens. <laughs> All right. I think I have, do I have the next one or do you have the next There's one? Am I going twice in a row? Goes, yep. Goes to you. I think it's me again. There we go. All right. That's awesome. And then we'll leave the best for last. Bill's final story is awesome. So I thought this was really interesting. This was a story that appeared in the Tribune. Um, the title really caught my eye, of course. What could unlock LDS church growth in Japan? Two words. 
says a scholar in a new book. And those two words are green tea. On the surface, what do you think about that, Bill? Just that headline. Yeah, the wisdom is something that ought to follow. But also on in Mormonism, you're also sort of aware that in various places across the world, there are different ways to interpret the word of wisdom. The church seems to be a hardliner about it in some places. Yep, no, it's true. And in some places, it has such a cultural significance that it really does have more of an impact on the members than in other places. And I think that's what we're talking about here in Japan. So this is um, this article is based on a new book, which is called, let's see, of course, that's right there, Unique, But Not Different. And it is about active LDS people in Japan. It's actually a survey, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and it talks about, it starts out with a story about a man who's in a corporate setting, a very important meeting, and there's a tea ceremony, and he's active LDS. And of course, it's very important that he present himself, you know, with decorum and, and how everyone else is acting. And he, what is he supposed to do? He's offered green tea. He ended up kind of pretending to sip it. And I have this slide here to show, you know, this is this is pretty significant. Here you have Prince William, you know, taking part in a tea ceremony. You, I pulled some other slides just from other important business meetings, and it's part of it. And when you're LDS and you have that health code, you have the word of wisdom, it kind of puts you, I don't know, at a disadvantage, at, at odds um, when you're in these kinds of business settings. So, of course, because we're talking about Japan, I had to reach out to RFM, who's not here today, but in spirit, perhaps. And he, of course, served his mission, 1979 and 1981, in Japan in the Kobe mission. And these are some pictures of RFM back in the day. Oh, oh no, here he is. What's he saying? Yeah. Hey, I'm about to tell that story. Do not put that on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got this great story from RFM. So he serves, I, I asked him, I said, hey, I'm doing a thing on green tea. Do you have any stories like that? He goes, oh boy, do I ever. And that's what he just said. He said he had a whole family ready to be baptized, but they just couldn't get past the green tea issue. And I can understand it because it really does put you, it sets you apart, I think, from anybody else. And it can cause so many problems socially. So my slide here says, as for me and my house, we will serve tea. And so I think that RFM did not baptize that family simply from the issue of green tea. The other story, I asked him, did you ever have a situation where you were asked to drink green tea? And he said, oh, yeah. He said that he, is, he and his companion went to an apartment and they were teaching someone and they were offered green tea. Of course, they politely declined. And the gentleman took a samurai sword off the wall and threatened to like chop them up into little bits if they wouldn't drink the tea. So, of course, my slide says drink tea or die. And from RFM's perspective, he said he was ready to die. He was ready <laughs> to follow the word of wisdom to death. So I don't know how he feels now about that, but but I think you see how seriously people took that. It's such it's it's just a dividing line, I think, in Japan. So I thought those were great stories from RFM. Had you heard those before, Bill? <laughs> um, I don't know. I've heard a lot of stories from RFM. I don't think so. <laughs> Not those. Yep, probably not. Okay. So like I said, this is based on a book. It's based on data gathered from a lengthy survey um, that they sent out to active LDS members in Japan. And they had about between 440 and 530 responses. And they focused their efforts for this survey on LDS members that attended regularly. So they said about 20% of the country's 130,000 Latter-day Saints. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I kind of crunched the stats there. So there's 126-ish million people in Japan. 130,000 are Latter-day Saints. So that's 0.103% of the population of Japan. The survey focused on 20% of the LDS that attended regularly. That would be 26,000 or about 0.021 of the population. So there's your survey group right there. I just thought those numbers were really interesting. You don't always see those numbers put out so clearly. So I thought that was good. So they sent questions to everybody just to kind of get a picture of what it was like to be active LDS and living, working in Japan. 
Um, they said that the picture that emerged is one of a devout core who are more politically diverse but more socially conservative than their U.S. counterparts, and for whom their religious identity, as in the case of the executive that we talked about at the beginning who would not drink the green tea, religious identity comes first, and that trumps their cultural Japanese identity. And I thought that was really interesting. The religious identity, at least those that responded to this survey, and anecdotally, comes first. So um, the study respondents, their party affiliation politically ran the gamut from very, very conservative to communist with a slight majority claiming no party at all. So in this way, Japanese Latter-day Saints essentially reflect, reflect the national landscape politically. However, politics have absolutely no role play in the religious ideology. And I found that very different than here, perhaps, where your politics, oh, they bleed into your re religious ideology. Sometimes there's no way to tell the difference in lots of cases. So I thought that was really interesting. So the example they give is in the United States, in recent weeks, um, there have been a lot of petitioning of the church informally, social media, on certain different policies um, for women, patriarchy, power, priesthood, women have been very vocal. And the overwhelming majority of Japanese LDS people have no interest in that. They, they don't really seem interested at all in these issues of power, struggle, patriarchy, women. Uh, they're more traditional in their gender roles. And I've talked to other friends um, that have served missions or have lived in Japan, and they have said that that is the case. So we have a couple graphs. I thought this was really interesting. So the researchers asked two questions. The first question was, women do not have enough say in church, okay? So they wanted to know if people agreed or disagreed, right? So if you look at this graph, it's almost like they don't care. No, we don't, we don't think that women don't have, I'm going to use a double negative. We don't think that women don't have say in church. We're perfectly fine with the degree to which women do have a say in church. And that was across the board, women and men. So for example, six, 7% of Japanese women and men and 18, 17 American women and men all thought that women, you know, it was just fine. There was no issue there. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but you can see definitely the cultural differences when you look at the people that strongly disagree. So I thought that was very interesting. The other question they ask is uh, the fact that women do not hold the priesthood sometimes bothers me. And you can see the disagreement, right? <laughs> Again, it's almost like they don't care. They certainly don't care as much as perhaps people in the U.S. care. They are not bothered. Again, the 1% to 5% Japanese men and women, respectively, and the 18 to 19% American men and women agreed that it just doesn't bother them. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So if we delve a little farther into that, um, another issue, of course, really hot button issue here in the United States is the LGBTQ issue. issue. A similar theme emerges here with same-sex marriage. Around one in four Japanese respondents agreed with the statement, I support same-sex marriage as the right of a citizen, even though I have doctrinal reservations. So one in four supported that. In contrast, nearly half of U.S. Latter-day Saints, and we've talked about this before on the newscast, support allowing same-sex marriage within the church. So again, why the difference? That's the question. Why the difference, Japan and here? And according to this book, um, Japanese society as a whole tends to accept traditional gender roles more than many Americans. Um, that's part of it. Um, the authors have theorized. Another part has to do with the degree of loyalty to the church, which is found in active Japanese members when compared to their American peers. Being Christian, let alone Latter-day Saint, renders believers a tiny minority with the island's nation of over 125 million populace. Members in the Utah Bay faith with its Western style worship and critically its restrictions on tea come with a steep social cost. As we talked about before, gave some examples for many Japanese American Latter-day Saints, and most fall away, leaving only the most devout hardcore behind in the pews. And that makes sense. So the people they're surveying, just because of those reasons, are probably some of the more devout and the more hardcore. In short, he says, Japanese members are simply more committed than their American peers, and they have hypothesized that the church 
is acting as the preeminent moral authority in their lives. Simply put, when the church leaders rise to the pulpit and declare that God has called men to preside and same-sex marriage is a sin, they're going to listen and that's going to be their opinion. So really interesting findings, I thought. Um, one last thing, it said that researchers estimate that about 20% of the nation's 130% members attend the worship service and that growth rates have been fairly uh oh, we're zooming in and out. Been fairly stagnant over the last couple years. And they pin this phenomenon on a declining birth rate, elderly deaths, emigration, and most of the other religious groups in Japan have also started to see a decline. And they have some suggestions as the title, if we think back to that, um, indicates to invigorate Latter day Saints in. Japan. And some of their suggestions are interesting. Um, they say, make the church less American, starting by removing all the English um, trans translated words from church vocabulary. Like, and I'm going to butcher this, I should have looked this up ahead of time, but bishop is bishopu, you know, things that just sound strange in translation. Make it more acceptable and make it sound more normal. Ministering, um, ministratari, I know I'm butchering this. It's probably in the comments are blowing up. But again, the idea is find a word that means ministering that's culturally acceptable and change the language so it doesn't set you apart so much when you're talking like that. Um, they call it a strange code-like parlance that alienate, alienates outsiders. And, and that, I think that makes complete sense. Another thing, I thought this was a great point. Uh, the youth in Japan um, and my co-host Landon on Mormonish, he spends a lot of time in Japan for work. And he says, this is true. The youth are busy day and night with school activities. It is extremely intense. So the authors suggest uh, maybe be more flexible in church attendance, church activities, especially things for youth, because there is so much required of the youth in terms of scholarship and school that keeping up with the church, you're going to butt heads there. That's going to be a problem. And of course, the very last thing that they brought up again is green tea. More than any other single action the church could take, allowing Japanese members to drink, drink green tea would attract and maintain retain more converts. So there it is. And it's all based on the Word of Wisdom, which if you really know the history of the Word of Wisdom, and I'm sure you've podcasted on this, it's all based on that, which is not what it seems to be. So any thoughts on that, Bill? I thought that was just really interesting. Just the gender roles, um, the following the church leaders over cultural or political norms, and just the green tea. <laughs> it seems like uh, in the past, the doctrine that people of color couldn't hold the priesthood and they were cursed and less valiant in the pre-earth life was a much bigger hard line to hold. And they had no problem changing that when it meant time for the church to grow a little bit more areas that were predominantly people of color. I got to imagine if they really perceived that the word of wisdom was getting in the way that they would at least consider uh, changing the word of wisdom to allow uh, folks to drink tea. It, it just seems in 2024, the science is pretty, you have health benefits to them. Yeah. And it uh, seems like if, you know, are we going to hold that for another 100 years, another 500 years? It seems sort of strange to me to, to fly in the face of uh, what medical science says about these substances. Yeah, I think so too. And I think this this almost goes back to garments. These things that you thought were being relaxed in the questions, things that they might just let slide so that just culturally, you know, it's a don't ask, don't tell. And again, I thought I thought coffee, I thought green tea, I thought all that might kind of go that way where it was up to your personal interpretation and up to, you know, you and your doctor kind of a thing. And again, they're doubling down on all that. And these are very specific control issues. I thought when you put the questions up at the beginning about, you know, being honest or it's all very open to interpretation. These questions are not when they phrase them in a certain way. Do you put garments on? That's a yes or no. Are you wearing them or not? Are you having a mug of coffee or tea? That's very specific. There's no room for interpretation on that. So they seem to be doubling down on the things that they can control like that, where it's a yes or a no. The other things, wiggle room. Am I honest in all my dealings? Eh open to interpretation. 
in high demand fundamentalist religion is these sorts of things. And then till Mormonism decides it no longer wants to be uh, a cult uh, and the nice way of saying it is a high demand fundamentalist religion, yeah. they're going to continue doing business as, as usual. Yeah, I think so. No, I mean, I have a extended family member who was having some issues where the doctor said, I'm going to prescribe to you two cups of coffee a day, and this will really help you with the issues mm. that you're having. And the family member would not do it. And the doctor said, well, then I'm going to have to prescribe some more harsh, you know, something that isn't natural. You're going to have to take some medications and that's going to be worse for you on your system and the outcome. And the family member chose that instead of trying something that's completely natural, not only not harmful, but really good for you. So I don't know. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. All right. Are we ready to go on to the much anticipated final story? I can't wait for this one. Okay, here we go, folks. This is our of the night. <laughs> uh, let's put it up here. Only a few weeks ago, we here at the Mormon Newscast discussed the church's recent teachings regarding the church's stance on artificial intelligence, a.k.a. AI. The church recently released a statement outlining guidelines for the use of artificial intelligence in its interactions with members. The statement emphasized transparency as a guiding principle, stating that people interacting with the church should understand clearly when they are interfacing with AI and that attribution should be provided for AI-generated content when necessary so that members will always be able to know when what they are hearing or seeing is real and it isn't. However, during a recent general conference last weekend, something caught the attention of viewers raising questions about the church's adherence to its own guiding principle. President Nelson appeared to be sitting in a wheelchair with an apparent adaptation using a green screen or some other mechanism to make it appear as though one of those traditional red chairs was immediately behind him and that he was sitting in it. The normal traditional red chairs occupy every six months at conference. But that wasn't the only thing that caught the viewer's attention. It appears the church may have also utilized artificial intelligence to alter President Nelson's appearance, make him appear younger. Some sort of Snapchat or TikTok-like filter appears to have been applied to smooth out Nelson's face and his ears in a seeming move that once again has LDS leaders saying one thing in doing it. What does it say about the church that seems to lie, deceive, and obfuscate at every chance it gets. What would happen if they just told the truth? For the record, we use AI all the time at the Mormon Newscast and at Mormon Discussion for that matter, such as here, here, and here. But we never told you we wouldn't. And we also never told you that we would not use such to deceive you and then only a few weeks later deceive you. The more things change, the more they remain the same. To the church, if you are going to tell members to trust you, that what you present to them will not be modified, or if it is that you will inform members of the modification, then do such. And if you're not going to inform members when you use AI or deceive your audience into intentionally seeing things that are not really there or hiding things from them that should have been seen in plain sight, then don't go to great length to act as if you will do differently. It simply compounds the loss of trust that people are experiencing every day with the religion that you lead. Be better, LDS leaders. Do better, LDS leaders. Back to you, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, I just found that 
really, really interesting when I came across that. And again, I was the one that covered actually two weeks in a row, maybe not in a row, maybe I think there were a couple of weeks in between, but first Elder Bednar gave an address at BYU and cautioned everybody about, you know, the good and the bad of AI, be careful. And then a couple of weeks later, Elder Gong gave an address to a church employees where he was very specific and he was very concerned in warning them about what he called deep fakes, meaning, and he specifically mentioned church leaders. He said deep fakes involving church leaders, meaning they might appear to do something or even to say something if you get really, really sophisticated that they weren't doing and that that could be used to deceive people. And so... When I saw that, I just thought that is so interesting um, because an audience is very sophisticated. People are going to understand and pick up, especially that people are going to see that and wonder what's going on. And And I don't know, what were your thoughts, Bill? What Was it a big deal? Is it a big deal? I mean, what is it? They just put him in front of a green ske- screen with a red chair. I, the thing for me, you know, it could be argued maybe... But the secret here is the ears. Yeah. And you pointed this out. I want to draw attention to this. When you look at the ears, they're smoothed over. When you look at the Mm -hmm. chin, it's smoothed over. Whatever they did, they wanted him to look younger and they gave him uh, some sort of filter that had him essentially looking that smoothed over. He's got the TK smoothie all over his face. (laughs) I want to find out what filter he used. I think it looks great. We all get older. We could all use filters. But I just wonder yeah. just on a on a higher level why, especially the wheelchair, you know, like my my the reason I was not at the newscast last week is that my father passed away. And we just had his funeral a couple of days ago. It was amazing and wonderful. And he was an awesome person. And he spent the last probably two years of his life in a wheelchair. And I never thought any less of him for being in a wheelchair. And in the care center, which he lived for the last couple of years, I had the chance to meet incredible, amazing, older individuals. And many of them were in wheelchairs or needed assistance. And I never thought any less of any of them. I thought this is where they are in their life. This is where most of us probably will end up in our life. And it's really all right. Everything's fine. So I just, I wonder, is it, um, is it that they're afraid that we would view President Nelson as less powerful or lose respect. I just can't imagine because I don't know many people that would look at someone in a wheelchair and and think poorly of them. They just think that's where they are at this point in their life. What do you think was behind that using the green screen in the red chair? I don't know, but whatever reason it was, it wasn't an honest or transparent or healthy decision if your top leader is almost a hundred years old and he's maybe he is a hundred now, I don't know. Um, but he's sitting in a wheelchair. There's no way that you can naturally without thinking about it and making choices to make it look that way. There's no way you can have him appear to be in a red chair for some reason. Again, who knows what the reason is and there are options, but none of them are good. One is to deceive members into thinking your leaders are more, spry than they actually are. Uh, One is that you're embarrassed or ashamed about the fact that your age is getting the best of you as you're around 100 years old. Um, I can't imagine a different answer because this was not him sitting live in the conference center. It was a a recorded or live broadcast Mm -hmm. from some other location. Significant effort had to be made to have the audience think he's sitting in a red chair when he's actually sitting in a wheelchair, there's something about these men that they don't like to present themselves and their religion as it is. They want to do something different. And what it leaves is it leaves members perceiving one thing when reality is something else. And that's a dishonest way for religious leaders to treat the believing members of their faith. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And I also was interested to see the reaction. I made a couple posts about this because I just, um, I wasn't trying to be mean or snarky. I was just like, this is really interesting. What does anyone think about this? And I had some faithful people jump on and say, well, you're lying. That's a lie. You put that in there. You drew that in there. And I said, no, that's right. From my TV screen, you know, you can see the, the play, the line that's playing and everything. And I wondered why, why is it so important that that isn't what happened to members 
You know, why is it so important to say, I don't believe that they would never do that. And I think it kind of speaks to what you're saying right there. I think back to President Benson, maybe you're too young and you don't remember this, but he was very, very ill. I mean, he disappeared off the radar and we kept getting messages saying he loves you. You know, he's thinking of you. He wishes you well. And then his grandson came out and said, He's he's very infirm. He doesn't think of anyone. He's not wishing anyone well. He's extremely ill. And of course, there was a lot of controversy around that. We don't say that about our prophet, but the grandson is trying to say we should be realistic. We should be honest about what's happening. Do you remember that at all? Or did, had you heard about that? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Steve Benson, the the yes. uh, Ezra Taft Benson's grandson, said yes. that they used to prop President Benson up for media uh, interactions, but essentially protect him from ever having to say something, keep him from ever presenting himself as he was because he was in the last stages of dementia. And the church seems to want its members to see its leaders as something other than they are. Benson's a great example, but it's not, not the only one. We were all told President Monson had late stages of dementia uh, towards the end. I have a source that says that they would put him in a room and play What About Bob and make him a root beer float every day. He didn't do church affairs. He sat in a room separate and essentially just sat by himself and watched his favorite movie over and over and over again, uh, eating root beer floats. So, and it's not, the, again, those aren't the only two instances where such a thing has happened. The church doesn't really want its leaders to be seen as infirm as they are at times. And that's also sort of seems deceptive. If, if back in the Old Testament, Moses wasn't well, he couldn't remember anybody's name and wasn't really functioning, to present Moses as if he's functioning seems deeply dishonest to the people. Yeah, well, it does. And especially since we know um, as members of the church, when the prophet speaks, what he says, we give that great import. We do what he says. So it is very interesting. I also feel when you have leadership like that in that condition, and I know we've talked about this before, a power vacuum can happen within, you know, the other members of upper leadership. And you have things that happen that maybe shouldn't happen, like um, November 15th, things like that. So I don't know, but I am curious about that. And I'm curious about the filter. And I'm not exactly sure what it means. I don't know if, if going forward, now that they've kind of been caught, right, with their hand in the cookie jar, will they try it again? But again, I say there's nothing wrong with aging like that. There's nothing wrong with being, it's kind of incredible that he's as old as he is and functioning like he is. And why not celebrate that in, with all of, you know, the infirmities and everything? Like I said, go to, go to a care center and meet wonderful individuals who are aging gracefully and they have wisdom and knowledge and sure they're, they're struggling with earthly infirmities, but they're amazing people. And there's no reason to pretend to be something that you're not. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say here is uh, you've got a top 15 leadership that is collectively as old as the top 15 has ever been in the church's history since its inception in 1830. Almost assuredly, while all the believers look and think those men are all mentally functioning uh, adequately, there's no doubt because of just statistics that multiple members of those top 15 have used that uh, get in the way of the full mental function. And nobody wants to talk about that because that's not what Mormonism does. It, it puts on a mask and pretends to be something and it never wants anyone to see it for what it really is. Yep. No, I think that's it. So no, I think that was an important story to cover because I think it has a larger meaning and a bigger framework that you know, we'll see how this plays out. So, all right, I think we've covered it. And you know what? We've hit an hour. RFM would be so proud. When I, You may not all know this, but whenever we podcast and RFM is in charge, because we take turns, he's always like, we will be one hour. <laughs> I think he must have somewhere else to go or something to do. I don't know. But uh, why don't we end by Bill? Is there anything you want to tell us about what's coming up, maybe on Mormonism Live or anything that RFM is putting out? What What are you guys doing over at Mormon Discussions this week? Yeah, we haven't really set in stone what we're going to cover this Wednesday. We do have one show that is prepared. It may be the one we run with. I think it's going to be interesting if we do. It is uh, rumors of impropriety in early Mormonism prior to 1835, and we're not talking uh, 
Um, also, uh, that that may come into play as well. But either way, I think we'll have a great show for you on Wednesday at 6 p.m. And uh, I'm excited for that. We've been putting up all of the old Mormon discussion content on YouTube, one episode every day. So, folks, if you uh, want to listen to those early episodes, you can do that. And, of course, uh, I'll just speak for RFM. He is, uh, I'm sure, excited to get the next Shakespeare and Mormon Sunday School out. Uh, Rebecca, how is Mormonish going and, and what do you have planned over there? Yeah, we have something we're pretty excited about for tomorrow night. We do drop episodes, um, our live premieres with a live chat on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 11. But there's a new book out. And I'm excited about this because I also run the Good Book Club and I help John Delin with his Mormon Stories book club. So this book is written by Lars Nilsson. And you may recognize that name. He is the brother of Anson Peak whistle um, whistleblower. Um, oh, my gosh. David Nilsson, right? David? Am I right? Oh, no, I forgot the first name. Anyway, it's his brother, mm -hmm. and he's written a book about the Book of Mormon and the origins of the Book of Mormon. It's called How the Book of Mormon Came to Pass, the Second Greatest Show on Earth. And it's got some really interesting, innovative research in it. So we are going to talk to him tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on Mormonish. And I would encourage everybody to tune in. It's a really, as I said, innovative, interesting look at where the Book of Mormon possibly may have come from. The burning question of the age, right? <laughs> and and I just want to say to folks, it seems like I had a technology issue for this show. I deeply apologize to everybody. I'll try to address whatever it is and see if we can't be back up and running uh, by Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I think we did it. And uh, again, we'd like to say goodbye from Bill and me and RFM, wherever he is. And we will catch you guys next Monday, always at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye from the newscast. <laughs>